are live on Facebook. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Beth Copeland with Georgia Christian Business Network, and we're putting God back in business. Mm -hmm. I am so excited that you've joined us today. Listen, it's Wellness Wednesday. Say hello, crew. Say hello. Hello, hello. crew. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what I said to say, and that's what Rich said. Okay. Yeah, I said, good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. He's an engineer. He's very literal. Okay, uh, yeah. there we go. There yeah. we go. So as you can see, too. you uh -huh. are in for a world of fun, but not just fun. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on grief. In fact, in particular, we're going to talk about the six myths of grief. And I heard some things behind the scenes that are enlightening to me how things are ever changing about what grief is and it expanding, you know, the category of what falls under grief. So we're so excited. You know, we've got our regular host here. We've got Rich Oswald, who's an LPC, Pamela Bridgman, who's an LCSW, and she, her last name is Bartell, okay? And they are our regular host and they're GCBN corporate sponsors. This month, we've been privileged to have on our platform, yes, Jenny Smith, and she's a grief coach. She's an expert in this area. And we would be remiss. We, we, you've seen that for the last three sessions and even today. What a value added resource, not only to the GCBN family as a member, but also to this platform. So expect that you'll see more of her soon, okay? And I have something to share at the end of the program today about where you can also see Jenny later this summer, okay? But that's for later. But today, as I always love to do, because it's so important that you know who they are, what they do, and why you really should know and care about that. So I'm going to allow each one to introduce themselves. You know, Rich is always supposed to go first. I don't know how Pamela set that up like that, but he is so obedient sometimes. Okay, <laughs> so start out, Rich. <laughs> I always thought ladies went first. That's what's confused me, but we're just keeping the transition or the, not transition, the whatever, the status. Format, the I don't know. Whatever. Format, I don't know. I can't come <laughs> up with words right now, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah. but like Beth said, my name's Rich Oswald. And as you've probably, if you've watched a few videos, you know my name is still Rich Oswald. It's always been Rich Oswald and probably will always be Rich Oswald. Um, short for Richard, so I'm not wealthy, only in name, not in financial stuff. Uh but I'm an LPC, licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia, I run a counseling practice over on the eastern suburbs of Atlanta in a little town that's not so little anymore of Snellville. And I work with individuals, couples, families, helping them deal with you know, maybe simple conversation and communication things or a recent trauma or grief to things that are much more longstanding or if they're in really dire straits, helping those marriages and other relationships heal and move forward. Um, and my, I, I joke, I don't, uh, Pamela might say this too, but if people ask me, what's your success rate? And I say it's 100% if you all do your work, but I can't do it myself. So uh, if I had a magic wand, I'd charge you a whole lot more for each session, uh, but I have yet to discover one or design one. So sorry, folks, you gotta usually meet more than once, but every once in a while, once is enough. So anyway, caught me in an interesting mood today, but we'll we'll see where this goes. <laughs> Pamela? My name is Pamela Bridgman, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have a practice in Northwest Georgia in a little town called Cartersville, uh, Georgia. I provide uh, emotional, mental health counseling, a relationship counseling, and substance use disorder. Uh, counseling. I've been providing compassionate care since 1976. I am an ordained Christian minister and an Air Force veteran. My grandmother to the wonderful teachers. Hi guys, I'm Ginny Lee Schmid. I am not a licensed uh, medical provider like these other two. I am actually a certified coach and I'm also an advanced certified grief recovery method specialist. That's a particular protocol that I love to use with my clients to help them deal with grief because in my experience, both personally and, and um, I guess 
personally <laughs> and with my clients, it's been super effective. And I like that efficient, effective gets the job done. I'm also a certified grief and end of life coach. And my company name is Change Navigators. You can find uh, Change Navigators LLC or Ginny Lee Schmid on Facebook and LinkedIn. Yay. I'm muted. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourselves today. And I'm excited about today's program for as I mentioned earlier, varying reasons. And because we're going to dispel some myths about grief. And this whole month, honestly, um, from learning about not a process, more of an experience uh, that is repeatable, you know, related to the same uh, trauma ties in experience. Um, and I'm talking Beth Copeland right now. So freeing, so very freeing. Uh, learning that about the drama queen, and I always say drama queen, but what is it, Jenny? She means Academy uh, Award recovery, which is when okay. we do our best job faking it and pretending that everything is okay, even when it's not. I mean, look at this. Look at this. I'm, I'm just talking about me personally. Um, in my long walk of years that I've been able to be blessed here and have actually experienced grief, and I've been... I guess accused of maybe having drama related to it. That's why mm -hmm. I can't get that out of my head. Rather than understanding, I really was uh, really walking through something that had been turned Academy Award um, in this field and didn't even realize it. So I want you guys out there that have joined us on Facebook Live to share with us this morning, interact, uh, where have there been areas of your life that you believed that something else was going on when actually you were experiencing grief. And so as they talk, I don't know who's kicking off today, who wants to recap a little bit about the month. I personally just shared a few things that were part of the recap, but one of you lend more value to that. And then I think Jenny's probably going to kick us off with six myths. Okay. With her nice notebook and beautiful handwriting. Right? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Post-its. Where are my post-its? <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Okay. Pamela, Pamela, did you want to start by recapping what we talked about last week? That was such a rich discussion. Last Thank week, you. We, uh, we actually <laughs> talked about uh, whether or not Christians should grieve. Uh, with Georgia Christian Business at Work, we often want uh, to focus on, on the Christian worldview, although obviously uh, uh, this applies to any worldview, but uh, in fact, one of the myths that come up, it, it's not necessarily one of the six that Jenny is going to talk about, is that Christians or people of faith should not grieve. Uh, and, and I can only talk about the Christian faith uh, and the um, holy text that we use, the Bible says in First. Uh, Thessalonians, not that we don't grieve, although that verse in the King James and several other versions starts off, we do not grieve, and people stop right there. Uh, and uh, as a language arts, uh, former language arts teacher, I would encourage you to read further. It says, we do not grieve as those without hope. So it is not that we don't grieve, we grieve, but we grieve uh, with, with hope. Uh, and so at the conclusion of the matter, after observing that uh, Jesus Christ himself wept at the uh, death of his friend, even though he knew that he was going to raise him from the dead, he still mourned him. So at the, you know, uh, at the conclusion last uh, week, we said, yeah, not only should Christian grieve, but I love the way uh, Rich put it. Rich talked about uh, it being a necessary part of the healing process so that if if you uh, deny yourself the right to grieve then you truncate not only truncate you completely sabotage your ability to, to heal so whether you are a christian or uh, or any other faith or no faith uh grieving is absolutely uh important um in fact and I'll close with this. Uh, one of the 
scriptures in the Old Covenant says Ecclesiastes uh, verses 3 to 8 talks about to everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under, under heaven. And verse 4 specifically says there is a time to breathe. There is a time to I love that we had that discussion because one of the things I, I hope to offer women in the coaching I do, grief coaching and growth coaching is freedom. And as Christians, we're called to have freedom in Christ. And I think when we don't acknowledge that something like grief is a natural, normal part of our life here on earth, and we don't accept it, we're shutting down some of our freedom in Christ, you know? So I just love that we had a chance to encourage um, Christians that are listening to this. And also I have a heart. I, I primarily work with, with business women, you know, business leaders, high performers. And I think a lot of the folks that we have in the Georgia Christian business network, you know, put that burden on themselves in addition to their grief, right. To, to not be that, that they can't perform as well as they're used to when they're grieving. So I just thought that was such a rich discussion. And I'm so glad we had a chance to hopefully change some perspectives and open some minds to that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, good summary, Pamela. Appreciate all that you had uh, put together there. It's a, excellent. We Christians do grieve. It's and language arts, and context and full, complete sentences matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I posted something on my Facebook page one time uh, about I have a struggle between keeping friends and correcting grammar. Mm -hmm. I also have, I have a struggle between keeping friends and reminding people to keep things in context. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yep. 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 Well, and, and I especially love that you led that one, Pamela, because with your background, as I heard you say you're an ordained minister, I love that you pulled out, you know, you went beyond the, the scriptures that some of us might know on the surface, right? And, and pulled out some important additional concepts and scriptures for us. That was awesome. For sure. We're going to talk about myths today, are we, Jenny? I think we are. So um, the context for this comes from the grief recovery method. You can see that my handbook is very well worn. This is called the grief recovery method handbook. It's avail available to everybody on Amazon or by contacting me. And um, so there's an organization called the Grief Recovery Institute. And they're the ones that came up with this method over 40 years ago. And it's been used around the world very successfully for thousands and thousands of people. And one of the things they've done that's really helpful is they codified a lot of our sort of cultural standard beliefs about grief and, and kind of figured out what's wrong or ineffective about those and come up with you know ways to help us move past those. So one of the things they've articulated is six they call it six myths about grief. To take it down a little more granularly, I've come to realize these are the six myths that teach us how to deal with grief. And they're not the, the most effective ways, but they're the ways that are sort of on the, the ways that we've all been taught throughout the years from the generations before us. So sadly, they don't work very well, but we all keep reiterating them from generation to generation. So there are six of them. Um, and first of all, before I launch into that, I wonder if do either of you guys have anything you want to say about grief, grief and uh, excuse me, about myths about grief before I share this list from, from our perspective? I believe that Pamela addressed one of the ones uh, that is most among Christians, most discussed back and forth. Um, and tried to see where one would land. But I wanted to share Hebrews 5, 7. We talked about, and you hear often that uh, Jesus suffered uh, and he became obedient through the things that he suffered. But if you back it up to read Hebrews 5, 7, and if you would read it from a translation probably other than King James, which I will for you right now, which is my favorite, then you'll be able to hear uh, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was hurt because of his reverence. Um, I think that is so key for us to understand uh, to what magnitude Pamela shared Jesus wept. That is such a powerful scripture. And 
to validate the fact that he grieved. And although, and I love what you added today, I don't know if you added it previous days or whatever uh, times when we were here, but you said also that although he knew that he was going to heal him. Raise him from the dead. That, that he was going to raise him from the dead. I'm sorry. Um, noted. <laughs> but the opportunity is his knowing that he still experienced grief in that instance, even with that knowledge, you know, you know, that he had because he was God in the image of Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? So he still allowed that compassion. And I was like, oh my God, the emotion was felt and he, he engaged the emotion. May I say that? Yeah. And, and, and does that not give us permission mm. <clears throat> to say, oh my God, I can experience grief. So that's the first one that I wanted to just kind of throw out that I really hope that we dispel even deeper today. <clears throat> yeah, it, uh, along the same lines of big boys don't cry. And I hope big boys would cry. Yes. And I hope that all of us would grieve. Tears are, tears are cleansing. Tears are an indication of, of what it is that we we are experiencing. So yeah, big boys cry and people of faith grieve uh, as well. You know, and I don't know, Jenny, if you're gonna address the, the just get over it myth. Yeah. The, the, there's only, we should only grieve for such a, uh, this amount of time and then just get over it. But the whole just get over it means it, it's like, uh, or, or the other one is a, a very, to be a very clinical term. You need closure. Well, with regard to this, closure indicates being bereft, being left without uh, feeling or remembering the bond that you had with that individual that you lost, which leaves you lonely and sad, which is akin to just kind of stuffing it under and you wonder why for the rest of your life you may have a little low grade depression. Well, because you quote had closure in, in that regard. No, you want to have a healthy remembrance. A remembrance. You you look back over and you celebrate the bond that you had with with that individual, with that job, with yeah. you know whatever that loss is, you look back and you celebrate that bond that gave you such uh, joy during the period of time that uh, the person was alive or you were at that particular job or whatever. So yeah, closure is, is overrated. Uh, so, uh, Remembrance oh. with hope is what we yes. want. I have a new C word that we're going to replace in pre we're going to use instead of closure if if anyone wants to join me and i'm going to make rick really happy because look i wrote it on a thing Can you <laughs> see? we don't want closure what we want is completion and let me give a word picture that describes the difference closure is like one of those big metal uh big wooden medieval doors slamming shut you slab that bar across never to be opened again and you walk away and you don't look back well, nobody wants closure when they've lost their grandmother or their right. spouse or their child. That's not, I think that's part of the thing that keeps people stuck in grief. So what we want is completion. And the word picture there is more like a revolving glass door. And again, that goes back to freedom. I want people to have the freedom to tap into those memories whenever they want. Frankly, to tap into some of the sad memories and maybe enjoy a cleansing cry, but not get stuck there. Yes. Um, in addition to memories, there's lessons learned. Like let's say you're getting completion on a difficult relationship with a partner or even a family member. You probably learned some difficult lessons and new skills and behaviors by learning how to deal with that person. So I think we want to have access to those too. So that's- I like that. Um, please, I like I that. <laughs> I like that. Thank you, Jenny. I like My that. My pleasure. Well, thank you guys, because you've we've already touched on three of the six myths and I can barely decide which one to start with because 
First we'll say something and I have my little thing ready and then we'll say something else. Rich, you can see I'm donating my file folders to the cause since I didn't- Oh, yes! So um, I think, okay, so I, what I thought I would do is just kind of go through them randomly and organically as they come up and we'll see if we get through all six. I trust the spirit will bring forth the ones that we want to talk about and the ones that people need to hear. So the first one I wanted to go back and reference is Jesus weeping over his friend who had, had died. And I want to note that he did that in community, right? Like he wept openly with all those people around him were, who were also grieving because one of the myths is grieve alone. And that little, you know, do not do sign, that's to show that these are all myths. These are not things we're advocating. These are myths. So grieve alone is what some of us grew up with, like boys don't cry, right? Be a, be a big girl now. Some people may have grown up in families that said, take that stuff to your room. You know, you don't do that in public, right? Mm -hmm. um, the kind of admonitions, like don't let anyone know what's going on in our family outside the family circle, right? So all of that teaches us to grieve alone. Nobody said the words grieve alone, but we're shown by example or the way we've been corrected. And so that's the first myth, which I think is very dangerous. And um, something you said, Pam, reminded me of a, a phrase that I'm starting to use, which is, oh, you know what, which is something I should say for another, another one of our myths. So I'm not going to mix messages here. Forget I said that. Let me instead pause and ask you guys what you think about grieve alone. Is it dangerous? Is it helpful? Why do we do it? Yes. It's, it can definitely be dangerous and there's times where we grieve alone but it's not the only thing we need to do for sure that's the requirement that says you can grieve only grieve or grieve only alone and then that's going to trap you in yeah. the kind of stuck place we grieve in community but the challenge is you know some of the myths they're said in a society that they don't know what to do with grief as a community. Yeah. So they kind of push us to be alone in it. And I think sometimes as the whole culture can be one of more individual independence rather than a community. I think US culture has a flavor of that. Of It's been made the country very successful in lots of ways, but it's also made some of these interpersonal and intrapersonal issues more challenging to deal with so yes, grieving alone, kind of times where you go by yourself, where you're really not even alone. I mean, I mean, Jesus grieved, but I think he grieved at times with just his dad, that he wasn't completely alone. We can do that as Christians and go meet with our dad and say, hey, this is really hurting and I don't understand this or, or I don't really like this, uh, but it, it did happen. So help me grieve, you know, I'm recognizing because Jesus wept. God weeps as well. And I think God weeped when his son was killed and took taken from him in the process too. So he knows the heavenly father knows what loss means as well. So, but yeah, don't, don't grieve alone, but it's challenging to find a grief recovery where people honor the idea of grieving in community. That's sometimes the difficult part. Well, yeah, but who do I go to? Because a lot of us don't know what to say. So we, if we do say something, it's sometimes not very productive. It's actually yeah, sort of like a counter Job's friend. <laughs> but <laughs> so, what was that? Yeah, it's a sort, of, sort of like Job's friend. Yes, um, exactly. We don't know what to say. But uh, to Rich's point, introspection uh, can be healthy and needful. But when introspection becomes navel gazing, then it can cause you to cut yourself out, to isolate uh, from others. And uh, we were never meant to be isolated. One of the things that, that I do when I uh, perhaps suggest couple counseling or I suggest family counseling or uh, I suggest group counseling to someone, I remind them that we actually learn to misbehave in group, to misbehave in relationship. Very true. Therefore, it is important for us to learn how to behave in a healthy way mm. with group or with another another individual. Mm. Right. Good point. Also I, I would like to add to what a couple of what both of you said um, as I'm listening here. First of all, Rich said three words that I believe 
anyone that's challenged with uh, not being able to feel and experience the freedom of grief has to hear or have validated because, and I'm talking this personally, I'm walking through this stuff and I, I'm just totally getting, receiving and embracing more and more freedom. But the three words he said is it did happen. And that was the whole issue, I think, that Pamela and I worked through with my accident because the other parties were saying <laughs> nothing happened, but it did. Something did happen. It did happen. Listen, my body tells me it happened, you know, and so you get caught up in, you know, even though and although I knew it happened, just hearing that that it did happen that was a, and then having to do endure whatever pain may have been happening physically or from other components related to so that's one point i wanted to make the other i'm sorry i'm so slow today i'm having to write everything down <laughs> i'm thinking while y'all are talking but the models what pamela was saying and rich started with society and the models i'll never forget and i just remembered this just when you were talking but over the years i played it back way back when president kennedy was assassinated i never forget my father figure my father making a comment of uh, admiration towards Jackie Onassis. Well, the first lady that it wasn't Onassis then, but yeah, but of how her and even the young kids went through, went to that funeral and never shed a tear. And that's the way you're supposed to do it. And so sometimes that shapes, and I don't know if Jenny, I'm going too far in something that you got later to share, but that model shape for me that if I cried at a funeral, that my daddy, and then you know how we relate our father figure to father God, he doesn't want me to be, you know, and all that. And he just went on and was at, it was admiration for her position and her strength. And so I took that to me you know, and even the little kids, you know, it was like, oh my God, this is what you're supposed to do. And you're not supposed to be feeling anything any sort of way, you know, and I, he never, I guess I was too young, but I never had a conversation with me that, that she care, did she cry at one point or some point or what, you know, that's so, just what I got. What's interesting was my mother helped us to get something different out of that experience. I remember that I was at school and we actually closed school early that day because our teachers were in such grief over the president getting assassinated. And my mother reminded us that the whole nation grieved and that we grieved as a, a, a community. Uh, schools were shut down, businesses were shut down. And as a community, as a nation, we grieve together. So I, my mother gave us something a little bit different. Uh, Quite different. You know, from, from that experience. Yeah. And, and that uh, is healthy to know that as a community, y'all cared and, 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 you know, we were all grieving. Just like on 9-11-2001, uh, as a nation, we were all traumatized. We all reacted. We all agreed. And I, I remember writing a poem about that incident, how uh, 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 the grief of the country was displayed when uh, politicians from all, from all parties and independents gathered on the steps of the nation and expressed the grief that the nation was experiencing at that time, which gave us permission then uh, to, to grieve that. And, you know, awesome. that's something that I've really been missing in these last couple of tumultuous years. You know, we've been going through these really big traumas collectively, but without that cohesion, right? Like it's been so divisive. So those, those are such good points. But Beth, I'm glad you brought that up because you helped me pick which myth, myth to talk about next. And it is be strong and or be strong for others. 
that's Excellent. what Jackie was doing. That's what your um, your relative was saying to you, was teaching you to be strong for others. And then Pamela, that goes back to big boys don't cry. Now you're the, the woman of the house, the man of the house, things like that. So what kind of impacts have you guys seen from this myth about how to deal with grief? Be strong for others. Well, uh, I, one of the things I work with with clients is defining your terms. And when I hear that, be strong, well, what is that strength? Right? Is, it, is it true strength or is it just avoidance? Is, it's more be avoidant for other people than it is be strong for them. And so it, strength, it takes strength to be vulnerable. It takes strength to be mm -hmm. honest. It yeah. takes strength to welcome other people in to be there with you. It takes strength to affirm that other people can be where they are, yeah. right? Jesus didn't criticize and put people down. He was, he was strong. He was the son of God and he gave permission, but he also, it's not even permission. He was required it. As, as Beth, you were talking about giving permission. I think it's even more so than that. It's kind of giving a requirement. Like you're supposed to grieve. This world is not designed for death, for pain, for destruction. It was originally created for glory and beauty and everlasting life. It, so it is going to be required that we're going to grieve because there's loss. And yeah, he said to his disciples, remember that scripture that we looked at last week where he said to his disciples, hey, you're going to grieve right now because you're about to leave me. Mm -hmm. right yeah there's, there's, yeah there's gonna be there's hope because you know that i'm returning but right now hey guys breathe, breathe. so so this the permission the, the the permission that says and validate and affirms you that you're not being a wimp that you're not uh displaying um an emotion that is supposed to be reserved for behind closed doors and such and and my dad i'm sure he didn't understand the impact on my life even to present day you know um and i was thinking about it uh really every funeral that were major and, and i'm big time grieving over from from him especially him i didn't dare show a you did not see me cry but i'm going to tell you and i don't know if this is outside of our scope but the impact was like, she, did you see Liz? She didn't even care. She didn't even cry. <laughs> I'm tear, torn apart inside. So that was a perception. And then the other thing is uh, beyond that is oh, what I was saying about all of the different ones, you know, then of course my mom, you know, I've got to be this model, you know, and I was his executive, I am over the, his still estate is open, but you, you see, and so I'm, I'm supposed to be the leader and I've got to do that. When Pamela's whole situation turned that whole thing on and people could start to heal. Um, I wanna read a couple of comments. You know, this is from Lisa and I've been going back and forth a little bit here. I'm sorry, I apologize for my voice today. <clears throat> but Lisa said, just sign me up right now. I need counseling. And she's got those side eyes looking. <laughs> shaking her head she said i've been stuffing it stuffing in a closure in all my life okay and 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 i can re relate to this because my response to her is this this is so freeing for me and she's going on like i'm like how they know how do they know and i'm sure that my sharing this and allowing you guys that are watching the replay that are even listening in now gives you an opportunity i hope i hope to allow yourself to revisit some of the things that you have thought and that you've learned over the years possibly from people like me that i trusted my dad had my best interests at heart, <clears throat> at heart. <clears throat> well so let, let's also take this as a moment of grace for ourselves for our parents, for our grandparents, for everyone we know who's ever said the wrong thing when they're trying to, to support us through grief, because we let's just say we all are doing the best we can. And the people who taught us in effective ways were doing the best they could with the best they knew. So um, 
what I think is we all have an opportunity to sort of get in on the revolution. And the revolution goes back to something you said, Rich, which is let's not use the phrase be strong anymore. Let's use the phrase be human. Let's model for our kids what it looks like to be human, which is the true strength that you were talking about, Rich. You know, that's the saying that I was going to um, bring up with the, the other myth, but I think it goes here because I think that's the most beautiful strength when we're a little bit, you know, when we are allow ourselves to be a little bit vulnerable in public. Like I remember the first time I allowed myself to get a little bit weepy in public and it was within my church family over a broke a breakup that I was experiencing. And that was a big like threshold for me, right? Like I had spent so many years trying to learn how to be this strong, tough professional woman. Um, but it, it draws people to us and invites them to contribute to us and help us. Yeah, so, strength Strength is freedom, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not strong to be deceptive. It's not strong to be thank ignorant. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's well, one you. of the main things. I like that with when people say, well, I need to be strong. Well, okay, be strong because you're being weak right now by ignoring it. Strength is to be able to confront the issue, not to ignore the issue. Anybody can walk away and hide from it, but not everybody can face it right and courage isn't the absence of fear it's strength moving in presence of fear yeah. and that's important too especially as you know as a man and as working with guys too to be able to say you need to do this this isn't like oh you have permission and no no do it you, you this grow in strength tell the people in your head or around you that that's a lie to, to be strong is to be dismissive right to, to ignore that's silliness jesus never ignored anything he was be more like jesus is to be more comfortable with who you are and if you're comfortable with who you are you're comfortable like jenny said of being human and humans experience pain and humans experience feeling out of control and humans experience being overloaded overwhelmed confused right that that angry. is angry don't forget angry because yes. we don't angry. we don't want to be angry. Right. Anger of, is anger is bad. Are. Yeah, right. Jesus was never angry. He was happy and smiling when he was flipping tables over and <laughs> <Right. laughs> he was telling jokes and enjoying himself. Or well, no, when I, he was sweating drops of blood. See how silly that sounds? Well, it's it is silly. That's the thing. It's the lies of the evil one, I think, who gets in there and twists stuff around and makes it upside down right when the truth jesus said is everything he came to say is like upside down from what the world said that the world was upside down if so if you do the double negative his stuff's right side up right so well anyway. the fact that we're made in the image of god just came up for me because mm -hmm. we're so scared of letting our humanity show but our humanity is made in the image of god we're reflecting god's nature so yep. i just again <laughs> grace for all of us but also permission <laughs> Let that be what we model to our friend, our peers and our friends, and most importantly, our family that's growing up behind us so that they can have some of that freedom to be human, to be human and to experience grief in the healthy way that helps. Yeah. Them. You, yeah. And you bring up a great thing too, Jenny, when I talk with people, especially guys about emotions, right? And I, and I say, well, because some guys will say, well, I'm just simple. Right. There's just a few emotions. And I don't need to say all of them, but there's just a few a handful of ones that it's okay for guys to feel. Right. Um, and then I say, well, whose image are you made in? Right. And then the gods, I said, well, is God simple? No. So then stop, tell, stop trying to tell yourself this stuff because you're make, kind of slapping God in the face to say you're simple. You're bearing his image and he's not simple. So can we get out of that? Absolutely. You know, something that came up for me a little earlier in the conversation was the fact that I think what we, we try to learn from God's word is always and and both, right? It's not black and white. There's nuances. There's um, different ways to behave according to different situations and things. So it is complex and figuring out how to be human is complex. And so, yeah, those of us who, who do that in, uh, in collaboration with the guy who designed us, it's not always easy, but at least we're getting some some of that guidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I believe the opportunity to is is being human is the roadmap for successful living 
is outlined in the word of God. We've got it right here. The, the opportunity for us is to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. Let's go with being angry and sin not, you know, yeah. um, because he was, how could he be, oh, I'm just happy and I'm just throwing over a table, you know, <laughs> really? Okay, so I like that, Rich, but the opportunity, he expressed his anger, you know, and he, he acted upon it, but then he instructed us in that anger that we make sure that we say, yes, I'm angry. This upsets me. That's natural because I believe, and, and I know this is going to go outside the scope, but so just protect our, our, <laughs> our topic as much as possible. I have to say this is the, the issue is that we're dealing with is the hardness that it creates within an individual, that stoniness that you receive from people, especially people don't you don't even know. I have a keen, keen, very, very keen sense of discernment. And I can almost even in the presence of some stranger in the grocery store, pick up on the spirit is cold, you know. Um, and I think that is because of so much that has been bottled um, inside that is not able to get released. So, okay. That's not outside hand, of the but, scope of yeah. what we're okay. talking about. I mean, you said okay. earlier, that part of what happens when you go with this quote closure myth as opposed to the completion myth is that you, it does, it gets, it gets covered up, it gets pushed down. Uh, and the unfortunate thing as my mother used to say is if it doesn't come out the right way, it's going to come out sideways. And, you know, it, it, it it's going to be uh, very, very um, destructive and harmful to yourself and to relationships that you have. Mm -hmm. And, and so I that's not outside of the scope of work. Okay. Oh, not at all. We, we use the image or I use the image of a pressure cooker, you know, and the fact that grief does not use, well, Sometimes your grief will not dissipate naturally. It takes some actions, like by going to see an expert, like like we have on the panel here, for some support to work through it. Time, well, this leading into another one of the, the myths. Time does not heal. It's time is not a magical elixir that will make it go away by a particular milestone. So we talk about that pressure cooker, and we also say grief is uh, unresolved grief is always cumulative, meaning every little grief experience is getting shoved in there into the mix. And it's always cumulative, ne cumulatively negative. So the pressure cooker just gets heavier and heavier and more likely to blow if you don't um, have some effective ways to release some of that steam and, and actually resolve some of those things. So I guess I was going to move into a different myth, but I guess the next myth is time heals. And I'm actually a little spun up about this one, guys, today, because <laughs> I saw a news article um, sometime last week that talked about how what they call prolonged grief is um, in the DSM-5, which I'll let one of you guys explain, is now categorized officially as a mental illness. And just as a preview, that does not sit great with me because I think grief is natural and normal. I don't think the 12 month mark has any magic to it. So uh, I, I like the perspective that, that um, this fact can help people feel like it's okay to get help, but I'm not entirely convinced that the only kind of help that is useful is medical. And what they're trying to do is get people to go you know, get on drugs and things like that, which I, uh, and I, and I'm not against drugs either, but you know, there's so many nuances to these things, but anyway, I believe time does not heal. And I'm interested to hear what you guys think about that. It is one of the things I have to uh, sometimes convince people of that time doesn't heal, whether we're talking about a grief, a trauma, a poor training experience, whatever it's things in the past. And one of the phrases my wife and I have used is if you bury things alive, they're still alive. They're just buried. Right. So it does it alive. doesn't doesn't kill them. It just buries them. So you try not try to pretend it's not there. And it is kind of like a pressure cooker. Eventually it will show itself one way or another. And it usually comes out like Pamela said or mom say is if it's either going to come out the right way or it's going to come out sideways. And a lot of times it comes out sideways when you don't bring it out correctly. And then people come in to us and say, well, I don't know why I'm doing this. 
okay, well, let's look at it. And you go, oh, well, that thing happened back there. And you, what did you do with it? Well, I just ignored it. Oh, so that's just coming out sideways now. So, okay, at least we know what we're working with. So let's go back and bring that out in the correct way. That's really important. And so time doesn't heal anything, really. It, it, we, we get over grief things, even with, when they're small, I think we go through the experience and sometimes it's really quick right some sometimes it's not so much but you know, if you if you bump stub your toe it's going to hurt but eventually you can get past and through and address all the experiential parts of bumping your toe and whether it's the physical pain the emotional pain the self-criticalness whatever it may go through you get to the point of of whatever completing it or you know, yeah all time does numbers. is put distance between uh, yeah. the incident, the, the event. Just and sometimes like that's not even, it. yeah, it's not even that much distance. It doesn't get it, the distance sometimes doesn't even get any bigger, right? Chronologically it does, emotionally it doesn't. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Quite, quite all it does is put, and, and if you think of it in terms of reaching, you know, it just makes it difficult for you to reach True. and retrieve what you need to retrieve yeah. in order to have completion. Good point. Yep. So, I mean, you know, think about it, people. We all know time ain't doing our bodies any favors. <laughs> time ain't doing cars any favors. There's a few cars still running in Cuba that have been there since I don't know when, but, you know, wine and cheese are the only things that get better with time. So let's get rid of this myth about time heals all wounds. <laughs> but, Rich, something you said made me want to pause and let's get real about the costs about grief, unresolved grief. So a few things. Number one, like you said, Rich, um, all, all, all events in, in life can cause grief, but they're not all going to cause the kind of grief that get us stuck, right? Like, um, uh, you know, moving jobs or something like that may not strike a person as being really heavy for them. So we're not all going to get stuck on everything. But there is a lot that goes into the pressure cooker. And the way I think about it, you can either have an explosion or an implosion. Mm -hmm. An explosion might be um, triggering a substance abuse problem. It might be triggering violence. It might be triggering something like a divorce, right? And an implosion might be like all of those health problems or extreme withdrawal and relationship problems. So the other thing is we need to, we need to understand that the long-term impacts of not healing our grief have pretty significant costs that we don't think about because they might be 20 down 20 years down the road but if you just sit there expecting time to heal and those 20 years pass pass you may be ending up with a different and significant problem that you were thinking you were getting rid of by just pretending it hadn't happened mm -hmm. great point. for sure i think a lot of the psychosomatic for the fancy term right is the the psycho, the psychological, the soul and mental issues and somatic and the physical, it shows up. We bury those things and people have chronic illnesses or uh, a, a um, specific critique, or, what is it, acute? There we go, got the right word. Uh, acute uh, problem, and we can sometimes trace that to uh, a psychological event that's happened or a psychological uh, complex you know, situation they're in and their body's telling them, right? It said, uh, what's his name? Uh, the big trauma guy, blank and I uh, wrote the book, The Body Keeps Score. Oh, Bernie. Yeah, yeah, I can't. Right now. <laughs> uh, I have Jeff Von Vonderen coming to mind and it's not correct. Uh, another guy kind of let that... Uh, something Thunderbell. Eastern Thunder Europe, Thunder Thunder Northern Thunder Europe name or whatever it would be. We're going to need show notes for this one, Beth. We're going to have to look up the author and put it in the comments. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I'm Pamela's sure Lisa will. He, he has a book. Uh -huh. He has courses out there. I, it's on my list of courses to take. Uh, it, this He connects the trauma and the body, and it does keep score, meaning we carry those traumas, and it can be cum cumulative loaned well. it to someone <laughs> did you find it no i loaned it to someone ah uh, it'll probably come Bessel to me in a moment Van, vandercoat there you go Bessel. mr vandercoat yes, yes. okay another van okay. thing that i was wrong wrong van you're driving <laughs> something different 
Just because uh, yeah. remember, we well, are mind, body, spirit, and yeah. each one uh, impacts uh, the other. I was sharing with someone this morning in a session. I was encouraging him to do what I call create a sanctuary in your mind. Uh, we do guided imagery. I think I did it with you guys once at God, God, and Girls, Beth. But you create in your mind a safe place. And you use all five of your senses to take you to that place. And when you do, it also causes your body to relax because your mind is connected. We're made in the image of God, triune God, and we are triune beings as well. And just as the triune God, you know, the son, the, uh, uh, the scripture tells us that no one comes to the Father except through the Son, and that no one is drawn to the Son except through the Holy Spirit. So they, that trying Godhead works like that, so does our mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so as we are able to heal our minds of that grief, we'll begin to see that it also impacts our, our health, as you said, Jenny, our bodies, as well as our existential self, our spirits. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to talk just briefly back to when we're still on it, really time being that measurement. I mean, listen to me. I'm telling you what I'm trying to say right now. Time to me is a measurement, a tool for measuring. What you do with your time will determine what time heals. That is when the measurement can be applied. Yeah. Does that make sense? This is the way I see time because yes. I'm talking about, listen, the Hatfield and McCoys. Over time, because there was no uh, pro it, it process applied to assisting with the healing of whatever the issue that needed to be resolved, over time, it was lost. So time will only measure what you apply uh, to the situation, how long you've been hurt or how long have you been healed or started your healing experience? You know, you've got to start the process. And I, that is a huge myth in life. And I'm so glad you brought that out, Jenny, today, especially related to grieving and, and trauma, you know, oh, it's been a year or, or, you know, we misuse time mm -hmm. in, in the way that it is intended as a measurement and we calculate it is subjective too because somebody might give you a year okay your 12 month thing that you guys are talking about you know and, and i don't know how they came up in that study and decided upon 12 months and other times i've known people the friend that i mentioned a couple of shows ago that was talking about somebody saying well if i believe if you know where <clears throat> where they're headed and you know that they're saved and that they're in heaven and you're going to see them again it's like get over it thing that we've already talked about so be careful with that one is what i wanted to interject <clears throat> and can i say a few more things about time because i think it's relevant to what you just said beth i want to <laughs> encourage people that it's never too soon to start your healing it's never too late so for instance, if you're a widow and you think it's untowards to start your healing within a few days or a few weeks, don't worry about what anyone else thinks. If you're ready and you want to start healing, come start getting it done. Conversely, if you've been grieving for more than a year, quite frankly, one of my clients was grieving for about 30 years from a divorce that happened in her early mid twenties, never had another relationship, had compounding physical uh, problems her whole life, like really kind of withdrew. It's never too late. She came to me and she got a lot of healing. And so I wanna encourage people, don't feel like it's too late for you. And I yes. also wanna say, um, you know, there's different treatments and protocols. My particular program, we you're gonna feel significant healing after about 12 hours right? Like that's not even one day. Do you have 12 hours to invest in your healing? I believe you do. Frankly, most of my clients talk about feeling relief after every session, including the first one. So if you don't, you know, I'm just giving a call out to people. If you don't like the way you're feeling stuck in grief, you don't have to stay there. There are options. Three good options Excellent. Right on this call to, to, to reach out to. 
and and thanks for saying that and leading in to where I'm headed, uh, because it's so important as we close the show today. I even got some feedback from someone, Jenny, that I referred to your uh, seminar, I believe, on yesterday, or uh, yeah. it was great opportunity, and it was an affirmation, although they may not move forward right now with the coaching is what she was saying to me, but it was such an affirmation. Uh, to the things of what to say, what not to say, interact. And this was dealing with children. But yeah. this is what I want to say to those that you, of you that are listening today, that are watching the replays and that are following the course of each session here dealing with grieving. We have a powerful platform and I want to put a plug in for them. If you are any way challenged in some regard that we're talked about, even this month on grieving or even outside of grievance, maybe narcissism or other opportunities um, that you're dealing with, people with narcissistic behaviors or whatever it is, these people here that are on this platform, I want to tell you they're tried and true. Can I say it like that? These are, they are professional and they can relate to you uh, it, from a uh, spiritual component or Really, I'm just going to leave that right there because that's what you really need for healing. This Beth Copeland's saying it, okay? But they take clients. You don't have to be a believer uh, to be able to go to them. But I would highly recommend it. And I'm assured that Lisa's got the information. And thank you so much, Lisa, for mending the post over there today over in our Facebook Live group. And those of you that are joined us, we really appreciate your being here. I just want to send a shout out to the Faithfuls and Angela and Toby and all of those that uh, pop in and out in their us. April was out there uh, yesterday, I know. And I mean, just so many people that are out there. And Lisa, thank you so much. And I think we really get healed or receive healing and growth and I know I do personally from watching these opportunities thank you Alveda for being there as well we really appreciate you all uh, I love wellness Wednesday I love everything that GCBN represents but this is really an opportunity for us to be able to be empowered enlightened and strengthened to go forward in the business callings that God has placed in our life whether it is as entrepreneurs aspiring business owners and even business professionals in the marketplace. Listen, visit our website, www.gcbnetwork.com. Great opportunities for you to get involved, to undergird our vision, to put God back in business. We're doing a great work. We're like Nehemiah. We're doing a great work and we won't come down. We wholeheartedly believe that <laughs> we have an outstanding, um, line up next week. Uh, Rich and Pamela will probably be back with us next Wednesday on Wellness Wednesday. Um, Tuesday, I'm so excited to tell you that Dr. Rodney Agin and Kim Wilson, um, I mean, excuse me, Kim Wilson, Kim Smith, both are provider level sponsors with GCBN are going to take the platform on Tuesday to talk about elevation through coaching certification. And it is going to be outstanding. It is amazing what a testimony that both of those are gonna bring as a result of connecting provider sponsors of Georgia Christian Business Network, connecting through our Zoom Take Charge Tuesday, and then you'll have to show up at 12 o'clock on Tuesday to hear the results of that. So if you're in interested in saying, well, I always, I, you know, I coach, I do a little bit of coaching here and there on the side, but I really don't have my coaching certification, it would be a great opportunity for you to join. Also, those of you that are interested in becoming strengthened and empowered and doing greater in your business aspirations and need a coach, it'd be great for you to join this platform on Tuesday as well. Uh, April is outstanding. I'm telling you, it's booked. I know Wellness Wednesday, we're going to talk about transformation. So go ahead and put it on your calendars. We worked that out a couple of few months ago, right? We have a guest that we're going to introduce you to, Sandra Stapp, that is a new member to Georgia Christian Business Network for a couple of those shows. But listen, we're doing a great work. I have to put this plug in for Georgia Christian Business uh, seventh annual God Golfing Girls event. I am so excited. I've got two of 
our GCBN member sponsors that are on this platform right now that are also going to sponsor GGG, God Golfing Girls. And I'm excited about it. And I have to announce that just recently, Jenny accepted an opportunity to be a presenter at the event as well. So we are totally excited. I've been so moved by the opportunity to just hear her expound on uh, this particular topic, but not limited to grief recovery, if I may. It's also that her business addresses issues that are barrier to women going forth in business. And that's what we need to hear at God Golfing Girls. So we're excited about that. And I wanted to announce that while you're on the platform, Jenny, if I may. We want to give Angela Hamlet, and we announce her as our MVP, okay? Listen, I follow the lead of my team and that's what Lisa said, we're calling her and we taught how to staff meeting on, I don't even know what the day is, it's Wednesday, I guess, Wellness Wednesday. So Monday, we have our staff <laughs> meeting. I'm sorry. I'm going to be honest. I'm challenged physically today. I am, but it is so good. I wouldn't dare not be here. Um, and I got to read a comment that she made as we close the show today. Uh, she said, emotional grief never goes away, <clears throat> but can we get over it to be productive? I find past childhood grief makes me so emotional now. It was buried for so long, or I choose not to give it a name. Mind, body, and spirit, we must create a safe place in our minds. And I think that uh, you guys would probably have some comments to that. And maybe we'll get a chance some um, next week to talk about that. But I want to thank you, Angela, for your support. You're just such an outstanding uh, individual, you're one leg in the marketplace, you're one leg in business ownership through Ubuntu. It's, it's just wonderful, the great work that you do for the community. And you recently joined me. I recommended it. And really, Jessica Copeland, my daughter, Dr. Jess, and I were praying about some opportunities because they were asking me for to help them identify people that we would nominate to be a part of expanding the board. And through Jessica and I working, and when she said it to me, I was like, oh my God, most definitely, Angela Hamlet would be someone that is totally committed to our local community here and would be a great candidate. Long story short, she recently uh, be, was uh, extended the opportunity and accepted the role. So Angela, we appreciate you. We celebrate you. We pray God's greatest wish blessings upon you. And we wish you great success in all of your endeavors. Thank you guys for being here. Y'all good counselors, coach. Yeah. Okay. We love you guys. Join us next Wednesday. We'll see you soon. Take care. God bless you. Don't forget to join. GCBM. We need members and sponsors. All right. We're putting God back in business. Bye-bye now.